Welcome back. 150 schools have benefited from the digital literacy program launched last week by the Ministry of Education. In this pilot phase, three schools from each county will be given the tablets with an additional nine specially chosen schools. Well, a week after the launch, our reporter Andrew Cheng visited one of the beneficiaries at Kiamu Primary School to find out how learning has changed for the pupils using the gadgets. Nine o'clock at the Kiambu Township Primary School and a stream of Class 1 pupils file into the computer laboratory. It has been aptly named the Digital Literacy Program Center. For all the schools that were in the pilot stage, such a room had to be built. The windows have been reinforced, the door, which was wooden, is now metal, and the school had to build a vault-like structure with the charging ports inside, where the tablets can be charged overnight. There are also charging tables in the classroom. Even the desks are new. On the desk. Have you? But it is the tablets themselves that are changing lessons as the pupils and teachers knew it. Once the pupils have settled in, they are required to power the gadgets. We are going to open those tablets. Isn't it? How do we open? Remember you have to place the button at the bottom. Can you place the button? Place your button at the bottom. While before it was all chalks, pencils, crayons and drawing books, things are changing. The pupils may be forced to be familiar with such terms not common with their level of education. Once they are on, every pupil is required to log into the system by typing their names and their class. Which is the class? Then you press what? Okay. Okay. Tap. Okay. Now your name is already there. The tablets are all connected to the teacher's laptop through this router to monitor what everyone in the class is doing. So when we switch on the cup, it makes sure that every device is connected to the network and the cup serves 50 tablets. Yeah. And then what is happening there? Now the teacher there is teaching. The blue computer is the teacher's digital device. Now the teacher is able to control the other pupils' laptops with using her computer. Yeah. What is the importance of that? Why do you need to control both the children's laptops with that? Because if the teacher does not control them, these children are most of them are digital. They are able to tamper with their tablets so they can be doing their own things. So the teacher makes sure that all of them are connected to her so that she can be able to control them. The teacher also controls what appears in the tablets, making sure everyone is going at the same pace. All the lessons in the syllabus are there. Yeah, starting with the social studies, math, English, Kiswahili, all of them have been fed in that computer. It has uh, aroused their interest of learning. You realize that sometimes they usually got bored because of just staying in the classroom, the chalk work all the time and using pencils. But now when they come here, they are able to learn everything that we, we teach. It is in their laptop. So it is just switch on and it comes in their laptop. So their learners, their learner interest is aroused. The truancy has minimized. Every child wants to come to school. Nobody wants to stay at home. We have even seen some transition from private schools to public because the small children want to go where these laptops are. So it has really changed their lives. While it may not be the laptop that was promised, the tablets the teachers say are good enough and are serving the purpose of digitally empowering the children at a young age. So we don't need a big laptop for the pupils. That tablet is enough. The challenge for the school has been more secure space for the tablets. With 212 pupils and only one class which can accommodate only 50 pupils, learning using the gadgets has to be done in shifts. Tap, okay. Good. The school says it has made learning much more interesting for the pupils and the teachers. You didn't open. You didn't open. Uh, when we are displaying the lesson to the pupils, it is very interesting to them. And the lesson that we teach here, it does, and they don't forget. 
Just a week into the project, it may not be easy to gauge the impact, but with such expectations, the teachers and pupils hope learning and the outcomes will be different. Andrew Ochien, NTV. Well, they certainly are a step ahead and hopefully all the other schools and pupils will catch up sometime soon. It's approaching half past the hour. This is NTV Tonight, but there is more coming up. That's from Business Desk with Dan White. And what will it take to revive Uchumi? NTV Business News, in association with UNI Microfinance Bank. Good evening and welcome to NTV Business. I'm Dan Mwangi. More than 3,000 bags of subsidized fertilizer from the National Cereals and Produce Board illegally undergoing repackaging was seized this morning at a Kenya railway go down in Akuru County. The bags were part of an NCPB consignment headed to Kitale but were illegally diverted. Run! At the Kenya Railway Corporation go down the loading of the last of the 2,515 bags of fertilizer that were already repackaged was underway. <laughs> the repackaged fertilizer valued at 4.5 million shillings no longer had NCPB branding but that of a private manufacturer which only two months ago was cited as having uncompetitive practices by the Competition Authority of Kenya. The company running this storage facility has now come under suspicion for this illegal business since it is also a contracted transporter for NCPB. We suspect that Wilka may have diverted some of the uh, cargo that was transporting on, on, on our behalf to his own stores. This is the third incident in under two months involving subsidized NCPB fertilizer being diverted and repackaged. By part of this fertilizer being diverted, it worsens, it actually increases that gap between what the government is providing and whatever else the consumption is in the country. If any of our staffs, no matter what level, is involved in this scandal, we will take action. Kenya needs 10 million bags of fertilizer annually with the government only providing 3 million bags with the rest provided by private dealers. A bag of the subsidized fertilizer sells for 1,800 shillings compared to a retail price of 3,000 shillings. This repacking and rebranding therefore means that Yara Fertilizers Limited stood to make a lot of money. Officials from the National Cereals and Produce Board are yet to find out for how long these fertilizers have been here, but they say that police have already begun investigations into the source and whether or not these fertilizers belong to NCPB. Bridget Ngana, NTV, at the Kenya Railways Depot, Nakuru County. Now, Uchumi Supermarkets has been in the news for all the wrong reasons lately, with stories on the company's financial troubles, empty shelves, and fears about its future. NTV's business editor, Wallace Kantai, sought out the company's CEO, Julius Kipnetich, and the conversation at the company's headquarters covered everything from finance to supplier relations and the future. First thing is, um, the headlines have been very negative. I think the other day there was uh, one of the branches being auctioned, the goods yes. in the branches. It implies to me that Uchumi is in a lot deeper trouble than we thought it was. Uh, no. All the information about Uchumi is already in public domain. Mm. And uh, when we announce the results, when the restated results, mm. the results for Uchumi have always been negative for a while. It's just that they've been hidden. And all that information is already in public domain. For example, the Taj Mall, which uh, has advertised, mm -hmm. that advert was illegal because we have already registered a dispute mm -hmm. uh, with the landlord and we had closed that branch. Why have we closed Taj Mall? Because the building is going to be brought down because of the highway, yes. outer ring road. Yes. So this is something we have been talking with the landlord and uh, so that headline was of Azilias in my view. The problem though is when, when you have a headline like that um, for an institution which requires public trust, you, that's where people go shopping for their daily yes. goods, it drives away the confidence people have in an institution such as Uchumi and how much trouble does that put you in? My, my take to the mm. public is please trust Uchumi. The new management is working very hard to restore your confidence on this national icon and 
in a few months' time, all these issues that uh, are plagued Uchumi for generations will actually go away. The measures we have put in place are very deep. Mm -hmm. We have done a lot of reforms already. Uh, remember when I, when I arrived here six months ago, uh, when we announced the results, the results was actually, the restated results was actually uh, 3.6 billion loss. Yes. Now this was because in the half year, it had been reported that the loss for Uchumi was 262 million, mm -hmm. which was not true. The actual loss was actually 1.8 billion. Because that's the other thing, the books, as we had them, were erroneous. Yes, that's There was fraud. That's so has that fraud been uh, all removed? Yes. Can we trust what we are seeing now? Yes. What you have now uh, are the results of Uchumi are the correct results. Mm -hmm. And we have done a lot of deep, rep deep reforms. Let me just state out some of them. Anything that bleeds in Uchumi has been sealed. Mm -hmm. The subsidiaries which were bleeding, Uganda and Tanzania, we shut them down. Not that there's no business in those two countries, but the design, mm. the model that was adopted was actually bleeding the organization. Mm. So we say, let us shut them down. In Kenya, we have shut down seven stores, which includes that touch more. Yes. Okay? And the purpose is that anything that, any store which has no track record of profitability must be closed. Mm -hmm. In the process, we have offloaded many members of staff. As we speak now, we have offloaded 2,300 members of staff who were either excess or didn't have the skills to stay on board. Mm -hmm. These are of how many? Out, we now only have 1,500 mm -hmm. remaining. Okay? And even that 1,500, we're still tweaking a little, but we believe that that is more or less the optimal. We now have 20 stores in Kenya, and we believe those stores in Kenya are the most profitable. So Uchumi is actually bottoming out at this stage, and it can only grow. The other problem there has been is uh, supplier relationships. Yes. So your suppliers of anything from fresh produce yes. to white goods and all that, yes. what we have been seeing is uh, unhappiness among suppliers, long-lasting debts, and so suppliers come and say, you know what, we will not deal with Uchumi. So when a shopper goes into the shopping cart, you want to shop for your weekly or monthly goods, yes. you can only get half of the things because the other half are not there. Yeah. How is the supplier relationship? Now, when I arrived here, the supplier relationship was not good because m some of the suppliers had debts dating to 2012, some even 2011. And so, if you look at the total supplier debt, the total supplier debt is 3.6 billion. 2.2 billion of that debt is more than 120 days old. So. I agree with the it's suppliers. Bad debt. It's bad debt, mm. okay? And what I agree with the suppliers that they were distressed, but we had a system here which was leaking, mm. and we have now closed those leaking. So the first strategy we have had is how to reorganize the balance sheet to improve liquidity. Mm. And we are now selling non-core assets. There are three non-core assets we have identified. One is our store in Gong Road, yes. which is, uh, we, have, we have completed the sale. The big Uchumi Hyper. Yes. Mm -hmm and uh, we will become tenants once the, the process, the landlord completes the payment. Mm -hmm. Then we have a 20 acre piece of land in Kasarane. Mm -hmm. We are lo looking at how we can sell that as quickly as possible. Yes. The process is already underway. Are these distress sales though? No, they are not distress sales. We don't want to hurry too much. That is why we, we are, it's a balance of, let's not sell the, our assets at throw our price, so then we bring in suppliers, then somebody will query in future and say, why did you sell our asset at a throwaway price? So you're balancing the needs of suppliers and the needs of the shareholders. Final question is with regard to Uganda and Tanzania. You say that you've shut down operations in the two countries. Obviously, there's a lot of bad uh, blood created with that process, shoppers, suppliers, and the rest. Do you ever see yourself going back into these markets? Definitely, yes. Uh, these markets are part of the East African community. Any Kenyan company which has ambitions to grow, must always have an East African agenda. And Uchumi is no exception. It's only that we went there with the two scenes of Uchumi, which is bad governance and poor controls. Now, since we have cured them now in Kenya, we will then reconsider entering these markets when our liquidity position are strengthened. So I see this in probably in the next three to five years, Uchumi will definitely re-enter Uganda and it will definitely re-enter Tanzania and we are looking at beyond those markets. So in the next five years, we'll definitely have considered near markets 
we hope Ethiopia will open up mm -hmm. uh, in due course and we are also thinking of places like DRC. So in the next three to five years, our growth strategy is to look at beyond the East African market, which other markets can we explore? Even the South Sudan is within our radar, but we want to put our Kenya house in order first. And we have put in all the measures and we are just going through the final lap before our growth potential is realized. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Putting the Kenya house in order is uh, the words of Julius Kipnerich, the managing director, CEO of Uchubi Supermarkets. There's been huge holes in the company, but uh, from what we're hearing, all these holes are being sealed and the future is what we are looking at. Thank you very much. My name is Wallace Kantai in Industrial Area for NTV. The government will invest in more system audits to increase bank supervision. This, it says, will help forecast any malpractice in the industry. The Treasury Cabinet Secretary made these remarks on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Kigali. I think what these three cases have, have, have brought out is that, uh, you know, there could be a, a, an alarm here. We, to, we need to check especially on those malpractices that are not supposed to happen. And uh, this is what we now need to put more emphasis on, you know, enhancing the supervisory capacity of the central bank, enhancing the governance of the institutions in the, in the banking sector, uh, you know, uh, looking at the ICT infrastructure. Are they sound uh, or they have come up with a, in, a ICT infrastructure that are not transparent enough or they can be manipulated or the central bank or the regulator are not able to detect some of these issues. So more of audits, especially the system audits and all that is what we are now uh, going to put more emphasis. The central bank is working towards enhancing their oversight on this, on this, on this matter. NTV tonight continues with some politics and WIPA leader Kalonzo Musioka and Amani National Congress leader Musali Mdavadi appear to be setting the stage for a political duel. Well, Kalonzo wants Musali to get out of his comfort zone and also what he terms as his dalliance with the Jubilee Coalition. Mudavadi, on the other hand, says that Kalonzo should not rub off his traitor stench on him. Trevor Mbija reports. I know that uh, UDF, which now became Amani, it was enlisted as one of the parties that form the Jubilee Coalition. If we are going to be serious about saying no to political assassination, I want to call on my brother Musadi Mudavadi to renounce that relationship and move on. And move on and, and get out of this comfort zone. That was the salvo that got the usually cool Musalia Mudavadi out of his comfort zone, and he was not holding anything back. In a six-point statement sent to newsrooms titled, Kalonzo should not rub off his traitor stench and Mudavadi to cleanse himself, Mudavadi through the party's secretary general says it is extremely disheartening for former Vice President Stephen Kalonzo Musioka to stand before Kenyans and pour personal vendetta and lies. The statement further terms Kalonzo's utterance as juvenile politics at its best. Interestingly, the two party leaders have both been vice presidents of Kenya. Kalonzo's reign was between 2008 and 2013, while in late 2002, Mudavadi was the last and shortest serving vice president of Kenya under President Daniel Arap Moy. Get out of this comfort zone. Musalia did not respond to Kalonzo at the requiem mass in honor of slain businessman Jacob Juma. According to the statement, Mudavadi treated the mischief with the contempt it deserved because the statement continues to say he knows those were the words of a misguided self-seeker out to gain solace for lack of substance for the mourners. If we are going to be serious about saying no to political assassination, I want to call on my brother Musalia Mudavadi to renounce that relationship. The two leaders both served under the Moi regime as vice chairman when Kanu merged with NDP. But the statement from ANC wants Kalonzo to tread carefully, lest he be reminded of his worst political crimes against colleagues and progressive forces. The statement is quick to remind Kalonzo of his alliance with PNU in 2007, terming Kalonzo as a sponsored spoiler who was rewarded with a VP's seat. The statement concludes that if today the position were open to free and fair democratic nominations to pick a candidate, Mudavadi would be the first to hand in his nomination papers. However, the statement does not exactly denounce an alliance with Jubilee.
Trevor Ombija, NTV. And it will be time for sports in a moment. You'll be hearing about all the prospects for our athletes ahead or after the WADA decision. Stay with us. Welcome to NTV Sport. I'm Watson Karuma. Of course, the biggest uh, news, uh, sports story we are following today is that Kenya has been declared non-compliant by the World Anti-Doping Agency through its Independent Compliance Review Committee, uh, citing that Kenya's legislation uh, and anti-doping policy and anti-doping rules fall short of the World Anti-Doping Code. Of course, it's a story we'll be seeking reactions from uh, the athletes as and when we get them. And of course, the biggest story again is that the Olympic and World 800 meters champion David Rudisha say he is more focused on improving his time during this weekend's Diamond League meet in Shanghai, China. Rudisha recently registered 1 minute 44.7 seconds at an invitational race in Australia as part of his build-up build for both the Diamond League series and the Rio Olympics where he will be aiming to defend his title. The Olympic and world record holder will be up against compatriots Ferguson Rotich, Alfred Kipketer, Job Kinyor and Robert Biwot in the men's two-lap race. Kenyan athletes will also feature in the men's 5,000 meters, women's 3,000 meters steeplechase and women's 1,500 meters races. It is five past the hour and that does it on NTV tonight. Thanks very much for watching. Remember, NTV Weekend Edition starts tomorrow. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. And I'm Mark Masai. On behalf of the team, thank you for your company. Good night.